How's it going everyone? Today we're going to be going over the anterior pituitary and everything you're going to need to know for test day for your MCAT exam. So first, what is the anterior pituitary? It's this part of the brain right here that's connected through what we call an infundibulum. Infundibulum or pituitary stalk is another way to say that to the hypothalamus, which is a more superior part of the brain. And the way that the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary are connected is by vasculature. More specifically, this is called a hypophysial portal system. And just like any portal system in the body, if you think about the portal system that connects the GI tract to the liver, the portal system is an isolated part of the vasculature in the body that's going to be completely separate from the rest of the circulation and allow for a specific function in the body. And that specific function, in this case, is the hypothalamus creating what we call trophic hormones that are gonna act to release or cause stimulation of the release of other hormones. And those trophic hormones from the hypothalamus are gonna act on the anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary will, re will release its own hormones, which are also trophic hormones, which are going to act on target organs, which are going to release their own hormones. So it's sort of this cascade of the hypothalamus releases a hormone, which stimulates the release of another hormone from the anterior pituitary, which stimulates the release of hormones from the target organs. So how are we going to memorize all these organs? Well, the name of the game in the MCAT is to use mnemonics. And the best mnemonic is flat peg. Flat peg actually is the mnemonic here. They put an E between the P and the G, but that stands for endorphins, which isn't really high yield on the MCAT. So F stands for FSH. This is follicle stimulating hormone. So this is a hormone secreted from the anterior pituitary. And then LH is a luteinizing hormone. And both of these are going to be stimulated to be synthesized and released from the anterior pituitary by a hormone from the hypothalamus called gonadotropin releasing hormone. So gonadotropin refers to the gonads, so the ovaries and testes that FSH and LH are eventually going to act on. So FSH and LH are going to act on the ovaries and testes in females and males, respectively. Next, we're gonna have A for ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. This is going to be stimulated to be released by corticotropic releasing hormone. And ACTH will act on the adrenal cortex, actually all three layers, but primarily the zona fasciculata to secrete cortisol from that adrenal cortex. The T stands for TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. That's going to be stimulated to be released by TRH, or thyrotropin releasing hormone. So TSH will act on the thyroid to release our thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. P stands for prolactin. As the name would suggest, it acts on the mammary tissue to stimulate milk production. Now, what's interesting about prolactin is that it's actually inhibited by dopamine. So drugs that are going to block dopamine are actually going to increase the amount of prolactin that we have, and that's something they could potentially test you on. Now, G is going to stand for growth hormone, and then that's going to be stimulated to be secreted by GHRH, or growth hormone releasing hormone. And growth hormone acts on a couple of different tissues. It's going to act primarily on the liver, though, to release something called insulin-like growth factor 1. So let's go over some of the other hormones that these target organs are going to produce. So going back to the ovaries and testes here, these are going to release some of the sex hormones, such as testosterone and estrogen. The adrenal cortex, that's primarily going to be cortisol. Thyroid will produce thyroid hormone, primarily in the form of T3 and T4. And you don't need to know the specifics of that. The mammary tissue is going to produce breast milk. And the liver is going to produce insulin-like growth factor 1. 
All right, next let's jump into some practice problems. For each of these, I want you to pause the video and try it on your own before I jump into the explanation. So first, we're gonna go over follicle stimulating hormone that promotes the growth of the endometrium of the uterus during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. Which of the following best describes a class of hormone that stimulates the secretion of FSH? So if we remember the hormone axis that we drew before, the hypothalamus is going to be releasing gonadotropin-releasing hormone that stimulates FSH. And we have to ask ourselves, what is gonadotropin-releasing hormone? What class of hormone is it? Is it going to be a peptide hormone? Is it going to be a steroid hormone? Is it going to be catecholamine, thyroid hormone, etc.? Icosanoid is a little lower yield for the MCAT. The two most common types of hormones that they're going to test are peptide and steroid hormones. And almost invariably, the trophic hormones released from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, as well as the posterior pituitary, are going to be peptide hormones. And what's a peptide hormone? Just a fancy name for a protein. So these are going to be made up of amino acids. Steroid hormones are more things like the estrogen and testosterone that FSH is going to cause secretion and synthesis of in the ov uh, ovaries and testes. Catecholamines, our three main examples, are going to be dopamine, norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline, and epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Those are going to be, re be released primarily in the adrenal medulla, although some of them can be released as neurotransmitters in the brain. Thyroid hormone, that's going to be released by the thyroid gland. Icosanoids, again, are lower yield for the MCAT. Let's do this next practice question. So which of the following is responsible for the production release of the hormone that triggers ovulation during the menstrual cycle? This is a kind of a multi-step question, and we're going to need to know that the LH surge stimulates ovulation, and that's going to be something that you learn in the reproductive section of the MCAT. And so we need to know where LH is going to be secreted from. And if we know our anterior pituitary hormones well, that LH surge is going to be primarily a result of the anterior pituitary releasing luteinizing hormone to stimulate ovulation. Next, let's do this one. So prednisone is a synthetic glucocorticoid that mimics the action of cortisol and is often prescribed to patients with inflammatory conditions. If administered exogenously, what is the most likely effect on the hypothalamic pituitary axis? So we have to know our axis, first of all. Remember, CRH is secreted by the hypothalamus to stimulate ACTH, which is released from the anterior pituitary to act on the adrenal cortex to make cortisol. And one thing we didn't go over, but is very essential to the MCAT in general, is the concept of negative feedback. So if we have a high level of cortisol, that cortisol is going to go back and inhibit not only ACTH, but also CRH. And what we're effectively doing is giving someone fake exogenous cortisol by giving them prednisone. So we're increasing the cortisol. And by doing that, we're actually going to go back and decrease the amount of ACTH and CRH we have. And the reason we do that is because we already have enough cortisol. We don't need our hypothalamus, hypothalamus and our pituitary gland acting on our adrenal cortex and asking it to produce more cortisol when we already have enough of it. So our correct answer here is going to be A. Next, let's do this practice question. So a patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, a type of hypothyroidism with low thyroid levels, visits her primary care physician. Upon review of her most recent lab results, the physician notices the patient's TSH is 8.4 and the normal range is about 0.4 to 4. Which of the following is most appropriate action by the physician? So we have to draw out our axis. TRH is released by the hypothalamus which causes the secretion of TSH from the anterior pituitary, which acts on the thyroid gland to create T3 and T4. Now, patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, they have a problem with their thyroid gland. So basically, we're not having enough thyroid hormone. So we have a reduced amount of thyroid hormone. That's what the problem is fundamentally in hypothyroidism. As a result, we're not getting that negative feedback like we saw in the last problem. So we get an increase in the amount of TSH and an increase in the amount of TRH. The hypothalamus and then the anterior pituitary is telling that poor thyroid gland that's trying its hardest to make thyroid hormone to work even harder. And that's what we see with TSH. So interestingly, when the TSH is high, 
that tells us this patient is too hypothyroid. We need to give them more of the thyroid hormone that they're not making themselves. So high TSH actually means someone is hypothyroid. So we can go ahead and eliminate the answers C and D that tell us that the patient is hyperthyroid. Okay. Then the question becomes, what should we do? Should we decrease the dose of their exogenously administered thyroid hormone or should we increase the dose? And the answer is actually increase the dose because again, we're hypothyroid. We don't have enough of that thyroid hormone due to the inflammation due to this patient's underlying condition, which is this Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And then let's wrap up with this last practice question. An eight-year-old child with growth hormone deficiency is prescribed exogenous human growth hormone, or HGH. Which of the following is most likely physiological consequence of the HGH administration? Well, we have to know our access here. Our growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus stimulates the secretion of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary, which acts on the liver to create IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1. And so we're going to simply increase the amount of insulin-like growth factor 1 in the liver. Now C, that's actually the opposite of what that's going to do. So decreasing muscle mass and strength would be a consequence of low growth hormone. And then D is again the opposite. So increased growth hormone releasing hormone is what we would have if we had low levels of growth hormone. We would cause the hypothalamus to want to increase the amount of growth hormone releasing hormone to increase the amount of growth hormone that we had.